in the slammer. 35 years inside with Noel Razor Smith. Hello and welcome to In the Slammer, 35 years inside with Noel Razor Smith. My name's Elliot Frisby, and this is the podcast where we talk the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So, Noel, what I wanted to start talking about, because it's our very first podcast, um, we're going to cover loads of different topics, but I find it quite interesting that when people read about a crime or something that's, go- something that's gone on in the newspapers, they've people can get very, very judgmental. They don't often see the life behind the crime itself. Yeah. So it makes, makes me wonder, and I think people would be interested, what got you into crime? Um, well, I suppose really uh, I got into crime by accident. It wasn't, it, in one way it was a conscious decision, but after the incident that, that kind of uh, got me was, um, I was 14 years old, um, living in South London. I was playing truant from school one day with a mate of mine. And we ended up uh, walking the streets. Sometimes we used to go to the museums and stuff like that if it was cold or libraries. We're walking down the street one day, messing around as you do, as kids do. And suddenly we were confronted by uh, several large men, plainclothes men, smelt strongly of drink. Um, And they proceeded to drag us into the back of an unmarked uh, van, an old comma van, and uh, beat and tortured us. There's no other word for it. They broke um, my finger, they snapped that finger. I became unconscious um, and they brought me round and then tried to snap another finger on the other hand. My, my friend was being severely beaten in the van by, at this time and it turned out uh, that they were a quite notorious undercover burglary squad that worked in South London. Um, they had a bit of a reputation. We didn't know, we weren't criminals, we didn't know anything about it. But what they'd done was they'd gone out for a drink at lunchtime and uh, decided we looked a couple of like lads, a couple of toe rags, and they tried to get us to admit to burglaries that we hadn't committed. Um, of course, with the Peters, we're 14-year-old boys. We're going to admit to anything mm. after that. Uh, so we admitted to something like, uh, I think it was around 60 burglaries, something like that. I can't remember the exact number. Uh, we Actually, they took us back to the station, went through their books, and we said, yes, we've done that, we've done that, we've done that, just to stop the, the torture and the beating. Um, and... We were charged with these burglaries, and lucky enough, we appeared in front of a juvenile magistrate, which was quite rare in those days, who, who didn't believe everything that the police said, didn't take them at face value, and kind of looked at us and looked at the charge sheet and, and, and saw that we were supposedly, at the age of 14, st- doing burglaries at 3 o'clock in the morning and stealing antiques and grandfather clocks and stuff like that. Um, so she kind of found this a bit strange and we'd pleaded not guilty and we told our solicitor what happened and he'd then told the court and she ordered an investigation and the charges were dropped and we were advised to sue the police for wrongful arrest. Of course, this was the 1970s um, and suing the police was was a massive uh, effort and, and it took a long time. And in the meantime, um, the police, knowing that their friends were being sued, um, kind of took it out on us. And, and I couldn't leave my estate without being pulled into the back of a police car, uh, doing silly little things, really, twisting my sideburns or slapping me around the head or pinching me and telling me that I better drop the charges and I better back away from the case. And this became, um, it became constant. They would raid my parents' house at five in the morning, claiming to look for stolen property, which they knew wasn't there. We weren't, you know, we hadn't done anything. I mean, it was just a, a, a kind of a, a campaign of harassment by them. So I, in my um, immature uh, little childish way, decided that um, I wasn't going to take this anymore. I hadn't done anything. So therefore, I was going to fight back against the police. And this involved, um, there was a guy on, a, on another estate close to me, and he was, he was older than me, and he was a motorbike expert. And he taught me how to hot wire motorbikes. So he showed me how to do it. And that became my thing then. I would steal motorbikes and ride around the streets with no crash helmet on of South London, uh, basically looking for police cars. So if I see a police car at a, a traffic, I was so incensed at what they'd done, you know, I was so raging about it that they were raiding my parents' house and stuff like that and taking my brother in the back of police cars and beating him up as well and telling him, get me to drop the charges. That I, um, it was kind of a, a war of attrition against the police, really. It was an all-out war, really, it was. Um, So I then became more daring and I used to creep into the back of police stations and steal their personal motorbikes. Um, At this time, I decided to leave home. I was living in a derelict car on the estate because 
I, my thinking behind it was, if I left home, then my family and my parents wouldn't get the harassment from the police because they were really out and to how get old me. were you here? I was 14. 14, so you, yeah. you left home and yeah, was, I was living, living in, the, in, really in, a, in car. a car. Yeah, yeah, it was a Triumph Herald. And was that in Ballum? Uh, yeah, yeah, this was on my estate. And, and, and um, you know, I, I then became really wild, really, because I had no rules. Mm. Um, I could steal motorbikes. And all the kids in the flats would feed me and stuff because they all knew me and, and you know, I had lots of places I could go. Um, but what happened was um, they, the, the police continued to raid my parents' house, obviously. Um, and one night, I stole a, a Honda CB250 from Clapham Police Station and at three o'clock in the morning, rode up to Stratton Police Station, who had raided my parents' house, and uh, launched a brick through their window and sat outside revving the motorbike till they all come running out the night shift and then shot off. And that was just my way of kind of like kicking back against the system, if you like. So the fact is I was arrested um, for something I didn't do and that led me into criminality. I then decided that I was going to be a criminal. If you, if you want a criminal, this is what I'm going to be. And I'm going to be a really good criminal. I wasn't. I was a crap <laughs> criminal. <laughs> but... That was the thinking behind it. And at 14, that kind of is logic, you know, to a 14 year old. I was going to say that, at 14 years old, if, you, mm. if I think back to when I was 14, you're going through everything, aren't you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it, it's, it's, it's hard it's time. Hard yeah. time, you know. Yeah. Um, even like, you know, going through, uh, you know, you had like things like first boyfriends, girlfriends, all that, you know. Yeah. yeah little simple things, lot, lots of different pressures. And, and you're trying to sort of stand up to your, your, your peers and, and trying to be someone and trying to figure out who that is, aren't you? Yeah, exactly. So, but what really struck me was that, because you said some stuff there I didn't actually know, is that you were almost triggered by the police to get into a world of crime. Yeah, and the funny thing about that is before that actually happened, I was quite pro-police. My favourite programmes in those days were programmes like Zed Cars, which were about the police, and Dixon and Doc Green, the kindly old copper who was on every week, you know, yeah. catching kids scrumping and giving them a clip around the ear and all that. So, so I really, you know, I was into that sort of law and order side of things, not consciously, but I, I kind of, you know, I liked that, the idea of that. And then to actually meet the police in person and your first your first uh, experience of them is them beating and torturing you and, and then being the bad guys. And it kind of threw everything on its head. So when you say beat and tortured you, what, what, can you go into that a little bit more? Well, uh, one of them held me up. This was inside the van. The van is going at the time. This, this the, the, the police van? Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. It was an unmarked van. So the driver's driving towards the police station and one of the coppers, and bearing in mind I was a little skinny kid, had his end round my throat, proper choking me. And another one had grabbed hold of my arm. And then what he'd done was he grabbed this finger and then he twisted it hard until it snapped. I actually heard it snap. And I became unconscious. And I, I don't know how long I was out for it. It was probably just a minute. And I, I woke to him slapping me around the face. And now the guy was on my other arm and had my other hand. And was this isn't the police though, is this it? Is in, yes, this is police. These right. are undercover police officers. Because you, you were saying that when you... Um, we're walking back from with your mates. There was yeah. a group of burglars who, no. who who grabbed you. No, no, not oh, burglars. So that These was with the police. Oh, because yeah. I thought you were saying initially that when the um, the burglars grabbed you and tried to do you, get you. No, to... this was a burglary squad. Their the burg job was oh, the burglary squad. Yeah, yeah. They were undercover. What I oh. used to do was, and I, I've no doubt they still do it, is burglary squads in the seventies would go out in plain clothes, dressed as builders, and they would drive unmarked vans and they would cruise the streets looking for people who might be up to burglary residential areas. So it was actually the police that grabbed hold of us and beat and tortured us and made us admit to all these uh, things that we hadn't done, which is. You know, it kind of turned everything I knew about the police up to that moment on its head. Where I'd thought of them as the good guys, the goodies, suddenly yeah. they were the baddies. And I had to consider myself as a goodie because it was happening to me, if you know what I mean. So that, to me at 14, that made being a criminal acceptable. Well, suddenly all your safety has gone because if you think, you know, if, if, you, if you need some help, let's mm. just say you, you, you're going for a bit of stuff, who do you call? You call the police. Yeah. But you had that taken away. So did, yeah. you must have felt really quite alone at, at that point. I did actually, and uh, you know, one of the things ab about it was I eventually ended up being put into juvenile prisons, the short, sharp shock. But when I actually got to these juvenile jails, I realized that I wasn't alone, that all these other guys from different areas were kind of like 
the same as me, if you like. Mm. They had had the same experiences. They hated the police. They were, in their immature ways, rebelling against what had happened to them. So then I didn't feel so alone. Once I got into a company with these guys, I realised I wasn't a strange weirdo, you know, that it was happening. So I was, I was kind of normal. Why do you think, if you were to have a guess, you maybe even know the answer, why do you think the police would have done that to you? To be honest with you, Elliot, they had been doing it for years. It's nothing new. I mean, they still do it now. Um, not so much at the moment, because you, you've got to remember that was pre-PACE, which was the uh, Police and Criminal Evidence Act 1984. And anything that the police said in, in, in a court was taken as gospel, especially by magistrates. So they could do no wrong. There wasn't any of the miscarriages of justice that, that were exposed later. The police were kind of seen as straight, upstanding members of the community and um, guardians of the community, when in fact, they were just human. They were just human guys. And if they went out for a drink at lunchtime and they see a couple of scruffy schoolboys and thought, you know what, let's get these to admit to a few crimes, that was kind of standard. In the 70s, getting beaten by the police was actually standard. I mean, loads of my pals had it. Even people who weren't really criminals, they'd get stopped by the SPG. And, the, the, you know, the least they could hope for was a slap in the face. Yeah, who yeah. are you going to tell? You know, so would you thing. say that that moment there, if you think back to that moment, would you say that was the starting point of, I mean, because how many prisons have you been in in, in total? Coming up to 50? Uh, yeah, coming up to 50 prisons. Okay. Would um, you say that that was the starting point of that it journey? Definitely, it was. I, I, I can point to that with... with um, you know, with certainty that before that point, I was quite, you know, pro-police and, and pro, you know, pro-law um, uh, and order in my little way, as much as I could be at that age. But that completely, that threw me. The world turned upside down then. Yeah. The police were not the good guys. The police were the guys who were beating and torturing me and fitting me up for crimes I hadn't committed. It was a shock, you can yeah. imagine. Um, and after that, I just see the world through a different lens. That was, for me, that was it. The police, no. But you've actually got some friends, some uh, ex-prison uh, prison, uh, guards or screws, and as you officers, call them, yeah. police officers. You've got some friends there. So would you say, like with most things, that it's a selection of, say, bad police mm. that would give the whole system a bad, bad name? Is it a 50-50? What kind of ratio? Do you think you're working out? And the difference between then and now, perhaps? Yeah, from my experience in the 70s, that was probably a ratio of about 70-30 because a lot of, I mean, you've got to look at some of the police corruption that happened in the, in the 60s and 70s. The Flyer Squad, well, you know, 14 of them were arrested and three of them jailed for fitting up people and taking uh, proceeds of crime and stuff. So it was kind of standard in London, certainly in South London. But having said that, um, it's improved now because of the, 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 the safety stuff they've put in place. Like in the old days, you would be arrested and a, a police officer could quite easily say, even though you had said nothing, that in the car on the way to the police station, you admitted the complete crime. He's got it in his notebook. You don't have to sign it, but you admitted it. It was called verbaling. It still right. happens today, um, but in a limited sort of way. I mean... In the, before the uh, PACE, Police, Police and Criminal Evidence Act, nothing was filmed, nothing was recorded, you know, and the police could hold you for seven days without charge. And imagine that, they could hold you for seven days without charge. And quite often people were picked up um, for crimes and were held for three or four days without even seeing a solicitor. All that time they're being questioned. So it has changed for the better, I believe. Obviously, there is still, uh, you know, there's got to be still a, an amount of corruption in the police force, and some of these things still happen, but not as much. It isn't accepted as the norm as it was in the 70s and 80s. So, you know, I don't, from where I stand today, I don't believe the police are all bad, and I think there is a great need for the police, and I've got a lot of respect for them. The dealings I've had with the police since I've been out of my, my last prison sentence have been, on the whole, have been, you know, very good. They treat me all right. Obviously, I get the odd, you know, snide remark when they look at my previous convictions on their radios. But, um, you know, I think there's a need for a police force. Unfortunately, in the 1970s, it was very, very corrupt. Yeah. You know. So what was it like when you say that you got arrested back in the 70s? What, what, what was that? What was it like? So you, you, they put you in the back of the van, on the back of the car, yeah. and, the, and they, they took you to the station. And yeah. say seven days. Were you were you ever held for seven days? I wasn't. No, the longest I was held without charge was three days. And what was that like? It's horrible. 
I mean, a lot of people don't understand what it's like to be in a police cell. There is nothing in a police cell. All there is is a moulded kind of ledge on the wall which you use as a bed or a seat. Nowadays, you'll have a toilet in the cell. You didn't have it in the 70s. You had absolutely nothing. It was brick walls and bars, and they would put you in there, and you'd have nothing to read. Um, and what they would do is they would try and keep you awake sometimes. So at night, they would make a lot of noise, bang on your door every hour, saying it's a safety check. Um, just to keep you unsettled so that when they interrogate you the next day, mm-hmm. you're at a disadvantage. Mm. So it was quite it was quite a harrowing experience for, for young kids to be going through um, at that time. Um, obviously, it's improved a lot now, but still I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't put it past them to be still doing that sort of stuff in, yeah. a, in a limited way. So you were saying that when the, um, the unmarked van, they, they picked you up as, as a boy at 14 mm. years of age, and they took you in and they, they talked to you. It just sounds horrific. I mean, I, I couldn't even begin to imagine what that would have been like. Couldn't even begin. And you said that was a turning point. Now, you've gone through, and we, we're going to address all of this as um, your, your journey and what you've learned and the people you've met. And, and you've got some fantastic stories to tell. Um, and what I, what I love about you is you're not going to hold back at all, which no. is, which, <laughs> which is no. great. Um, but you've literally turned your life around. You're now a best-selling author. Um, TV, you go out and um, you do talks at universities yeah. and, and bits and pieces, and I really, really respect that. But it makes me wonder, let's just say you were 14, let's, let's just jump back a year to 13 and previous. What did you want to be at that age? Uh, I'm not sure I had much of an idea, really. Um, one of the things that really intrigued me was lorry driving. All right. I, I, at that age, I was... I'd, wanted to learn to drive and I thought, wow, wouldn't it be great to be a long distance lorry driver? Because I'd seen something where they had their own, in the cab, they had a bed and the TV and all the comforts at home. And I thought, wouldn't it be great to go around the world delivering stuff and actually live in a lorry? You know, now I don't think that'd be such a good idea, but that was kind of where my head was at. I I was, you know, I was looking forward to, I was never really academic. I, I couldn't really read or write properly because what had happened was my parents were Irish immigrants, came over in, in the late 50s. I was born in 1960 in London. And um, at that time, you know, th- because they were immigrants, they moved around a lot. So we'd have a room in North London. We mainly move around North London. So they'd have a room in a house and then that house would be demolished. A lot of people kind of missed this. In the 1960s in North London and possibly in other cities, probably, um, it wasn't that long after the war. And mm. a lot of uh, streets had been bombed, so there was houses missing. And um, you'd have bomb sites all over the place, so you'd have corrugated iron fence up covering where two houses had been bombed. And it really was a filthy, filthy place, North yeah. London. And it was, it was all due to be demolished and all due to be refurbished, and it was in the end. You know, they, they moved people out. So we used to move, uh, every time they kind of renewed a street, we'd moved on to the next street, if you like. A lot of Irish families, a lot of Jamaican families, some Jewish families, they all kind of lived in the same enclave, if you like, and moved as the streets were demolished. And we ended up in 1969... Um, it was quite funny, actually. There used to be a, a television program called Today with Eamon Andrews, which used to be on every evening. It was a news program, probably only in London. And um, one of the where we lived in Hollingsworth Street in North London, uh, there was dumps on either side of us, like corrugated iron dumps on either side of the house. Four families living in a house, and we lived in the basement. And one of the families had left a baby outside in the pram on a sunny day outside the house, and come out five minutes later, and there was a rat in the pram trying to bite the baby. Um, So this reached the papers and all the residents were invited on us today with Eamon Andrews to slag off the council. We refused to rehome them all in council houses and they were left to this. And they all went on there and it it got results. Oh, right. Yeah, within about a month, all of us had been offered places to live, most in North London, but my mum and dad chose to come to South London because my grandfather already lived in South London. So we were the only ones that went to South London. And I have to say, it was the first house that we had been in, the flat, it was the third floor flat, um, which actually had um, running hot water and a bath. You know, we'd never had that before. It was a bath, a galvanised bath that you brought in out the garden. Was that 69 you said, was it? Yeah, 69, yeah. 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 I tell you, we're going we're, we're gonna to come, actually come back to that in another podcast and talk about your childhood a bit more. We can dive into that a bit yeah. more. But I think, um, I think it's amazing just sort of sitting here and having a chat with someone who's managed to turn 
their life around after going through so much. We, we haven't even scratched the surface. No. No. And uh, we're going to invite some, some guests on as well, um, yeah. which will be great. Uh, people that you've been spent time with yeah. um, inside. And also some ex-prison prison wardens. And uh, is it warden? It sounds very American, doesn't it? Yeah. Got, we, that's something else we're going to cover yeah. as well, isn't it? Yeah. So um, if you've got any questions uh, for Noel, you can, if you're watching this on YouTube, just, just write a little comment below. Uh, remember to hit the subscribe and the like button. Uh, yeah, leave your questions below. And if you want to uh, send a question, if you're listening on the podcast, you can get us at in the slammer at monkeynutuk.com. So that's in the slammer at monkeynutuk.com. And we'll do our best to answer all of those questions. So uh, thank you very much for that. No and at um, all. I'll see you at the next one. Thank you very much. You've been listening to In The Slammer with Noel Razor-Smith, hosted by Elliot Frisbee, music by Andrew Stamp, produced by Chris Byland, recorded at Monkey Nut Audiobooks. For more information, visit the In The Slammer Facebook page or visit monkeynutuk.com. If you have a question or want to contact Noel Razor-Smith, then please email intheslammer at monkeynutuk.com.